work did you perform? I went to HUD in uh, December of 1984. Sorry? December 1984, when I started at HUD as a full-time consultant through December of 1985, December 8th, 1985. And from December 8th of 1985 through April 1, 1986, I was an intermittent consultant. What's the difference between a full-time consultant and an employee? In my understanding is there's, uh, as far as I know, the difference would be in certain health benefits that are not, um, uh, that a full-time consultant is not able to take advantage of while at HUD. Some of the benefits at HUD, and I'm not sure what else. Mm -hmm. Some of the government benefits are. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that you received a waiver from HUD so that you could work both as a consultant at HUD and at Black Manafort provided that you did no political work? Is that correct? Well, that's not exactly correct, sir. As I, as I, <coughs> you stated, as I stated earlier, uh, from December of 1984 through December 8th, 1985, I was a full-time consultant, meaning that I would have to be at HUD and that I was paid a salary on a daily basis, a daily a wage, if you will. Uh, from, I was involved in a project at the time in the area of public affairs, which is, which is where I worked uh, during that entire period, both as a full-time and, and, as, and as an intermittent consultant. And uh, the director of that department, Jane Gallagher, asked me if I could stay on and uh, as an intermittent consultant on an hourly wage, which would allow me to work uh, specifically on a, a number of projects outside of HUD or at HUD, whatever, wherever that project would take me, that, that program, and also to work uh, elsewhere at the same time. At that time, I met with uh, a, a lawyer in the general counsel's office at HUD and uh, told him what uh, my plans were. He asked me if I would be doing any HUD-related work during that period from December 8th through April 1. Uh, while with Black Manafort, I told him that I absolutely planned on doing no HUD work, and uh, he gave me an oral opinion that there would be no conflict of interest. Who I, was this attorney? I don't recollect his name, sir. This was in the in December, November, I would think, of 1985. I wouldn't recollect his name. And you suggest that the opinion was an oral opinion? Well, I sat down with him, sir, and met with him face to face. That's correct. Well, how many attorneys did you deal with at the HUD uh, General Counsel's office? In connection with this, sir? Yes. Just this one attorney that I met with in order to determine... Well, how did you happen to find this attorney? My boss... Whom, the, did, you, whom did you make your yeah, initial yes, inquiry? Yes, I'll, I'll explain that. My boss, Jane Gallagher, said yes. that uh, she would contact someone in the general counsel's office to be sure Who that... Who was general counsel at the time, do you recall? I, I don't recall, sir. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, I should definitely meet with someone to see if there would be a potential conflict. I, uh, she set up that appointment, as I remember, and I went up, sat down, went through the uh, process of, that I was working with at HUD, which was logistics in a, uh, in a uh, convention that I was in the middle of, and um, my boss wanted me to stay for another two or three months to finish that project up. I also explained the circumstances uh, at Black Manafort at the time, which would be a total political involvement with a number of political clients and he told me that there would be no conflict. And did you request a written opinion? No, sir, because uh, he was pretty emphatic in our meeting that there was no obvious conflict. How long did that meeting last, Mr. Gay? I would think, as I remember, it was somewhere in the neighbor of 15 or 20 minutes. He asked me the nature of my work at HUD, what I had been doing there, and the nature of the type of work I would be doing at Black Manafort while I would still be employed as an intermittent consultant at HUD. After you left HUD, <coughs> you contacted Ms. Dean regard regarding various projects? After I left HUD uh, yes. as an intermittent consultant in after April 1st, 1986? Yes. Uh, yes, that's correct. Why did you contact Ms. Dean rather than the appropriate official? 
Well, I, first of all, I don't believe that Ms. Dean would be an inappropriate official. And Ms. Dean was one of the last people I talked with uh, just prior to leaving HUD sometime in, in March, I guess, 1986. Uh, we had a telephone conversation, uh, as I remember. Uh, she was the person who interviewed me along with Ms. Gallagher. I interviewed with Ms. Gallagher first in November of 84, and she suggested that I meet with Ms. Dean. Uh, Ms. Dean, in fact, uh, uh, told me at that time that stay in touch and wish me well, and uh, that was the basis of that conversation in March, which led uh, me to call her in the future, sir. Now let me come to your November 14 meeting with Ms. Dean. And I'd like to ask you to do your best to recall exactly the nature of that meeting and the particular conversation that you had with her. Can you tell me how that meeting was set up? Yes, I can, sir. I, and I have given this quite a bit of thought with uh, the uh, uh, anticipation of this question after cordially meeting with your staff. Of course. Uh, sometime, probably in a phone conversation in late October, uh, I asked Ms. Dean if I could um, bring with me the mayor of Camden, New Jersey, at that time current mayor as well, Mayor Randy Primus, and some of his staff along with some of the developers that were working on a um, housing development action grant that had been uh, turned down during that most recent round. They were not, it was not funded. And sit with Ms. Dean to talk about perhaps some future round Actually, we were looking for a specific time when the next round would be, and also for the uh, chance of some recaptured funds from that previous round. Uh, Ms. Dean um, gave me a date, which was November 14th, and uh, we met on that day with the mayor and myself and Ms. Dean. I think she had some HODAG staff in the room as well. There were a number of people there. I can't recall uh, everyone that was in the room, but uh, uh, there were seven or eight people there. Uh, the meeting broke up, I would think, after about an hour. The mayor and his staff left. Ms. Dean and I were either in the room or walking out of the room, and I stopped her and inquired about the availability of MOD rehab funding uh, uh, in general and specifically in New Jersey. She asked me... What do you mean in general? Well, the, uh, the availability of MOD rehab funds, sir. The, um, well, well, you knew that there were mud rehab funds. I don't understand your general inquiry. I also I understand there were budget restrictions and has been discussed here that that allocation was decreasing, diminishing, if you will, each year. And I was just asking her to the availability of, of the funds, it's, of the funds in general themselves, if there were funds available. She indicated that there were. Did you not know that there were funds available? I, I didn't know the status of the funds, no, sir. You thought that the program, the entire program, could have terminated without your knowledge? I, I didn't know uh, what the, uh, that's correct. I did not think that the program would have been terminated, but I did know, not know what the status of the allocated funds for that fiscal year were, sir. So I inquired. And, and what, what did you ask her? Can you try to remember exactly what you asked her? As, about I, as I've stated, I asked her about the availability of MOD rehab funds, sir. You basically said, are MOD rehab funds available? Uh, the best that I can recollect, I asked her about the availability of mod rehab funds in general, and then specifically uh, I mentioned uh, New Jersey. Uh, did you mention New Jersey or did you mention Seabrook? I believe I possibly mentioned Seabrook at the time, but it didn't mean anything. I was, asked more, I was more concerned about the geographic state itself, not the locale within the state. Well, obviously, theoretically, mod rehab funds were available for all 50 states. And we have and as we have abundantly seen for Puerto Rico. I mean, if the funds were available, they were obviously available for New Jersey, were they not? I would assume so, yes, sir. Did you not ask her whether she would make funds available for your Seabrook project? I, as I stated, I asked her about the structure of this conversation I had with her. But it's sort of interesting and important because uh, uh, then a meeting is set up in New Jersey and, uh, and uh, the information is provided uh, to 
to the people there that these funds uh, will be forthcoming and they better apply for them fast. She, she never indicated to me that... Well, what did she tell you? Th thank you, Congressman. Uh, she asked me uh, w what the status was of a uh, application. Was there an application uh, at HUD from the uh, PHA, from the Housing well, that's Authority? that's not how the conversation began. I mean, go through the whole conversation. Okay, I'm we sorry. I was picking... Way, we are a long ways from a PHA application from Seabrook. Well, that we was the next... first inquiring whether there are mud rehab funds available. I, Congressman, I was picking up the conversation as, it, as I had with Ms. Dina. If you'd like, I'll start at the Please back of the beginning of the, the beginning. conversation. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 as I indicated a few moments ago, I inquired as to the availability of mod rehab funds. Uh, I then mentioned New Jersey. Let me I, ask you this. Did this question just occur to you at the moment, or had you discussed this first with Mr. Manafort at the office, that I didn't. you should do that? I didn't understand the question, Mr. Chairman. Well, you had a meeting with respect to Camden, is that correct? That's correct. But when you went into the meeting, you had intended to deal with Seabrook as well. That is correct. My understanding is that Mr. Manafort and you had agreed on that before you went there. Is that, that is correct? also correct. Okay. So, uh, your intention was, is that fair to say, you were hoping to get some commitment from her with respect to funding the Seabrook project? No, sir. No? No, sir. As I, as I indicated earlier, I was inquiring uh, after I had met with Mr. Manafort. I advised him that I was having a meeting with Ms. Dean on another uh, HUD-related matter and that I would bring up uh, with her the uh, inquiry as to the availability of mod rehab funding. Yeah, but this was not a platonic question. I mean, you were not interested in the general nature of HUD activities at that moment. It would seem to me that your purpose was, which is a perfectly legitimate purpose, I don't know why you're trying to avoid sort of dealing with it. You're, you were planning to go in there for the purpose of getting as strong an indication of her willingness to fund Seabrook as you could possibly get. Would that be a fair statement? N sir, what is a fair statement? I could relate to you the conversation Please I had do. that was approximately three or four minutes long that I indicated to your staff uh, uh, to the best of my recollection. Uh, as to why I inquired about the general availability of mod rehab funds, I, I don't know, sir, but that was my first question of Ms. Dean. The next subject uh, was the state. I very well may have mentioned Seabrook. I don't you are not sure that you mentioned I Seabrook. I don't recall, but I very well may have mentioned Seabrook. I was aware of Seabrook, New Jersey, based on my meeting with Mr. Manafort some 10 days prior to that. She then asked me about the number of units. I told her that... For New Jersey or for Seabrook? I, I don't remember specifically, sir. I, I mentioned New Jersey. She said how many units, I believe, and I did not know at how that... How many units what? Of mod rehab funding, sir. That was the topic of the discussion, was availability of mod rehab how funds. How many units you wanted to get a commitment on for New Jersey? N no, sir. No, no, sir. Well, uh, then explain. Yes, I was inquiring about the availability of mod rehab funds in... In general. In general. And then she I said, got they still exist. Then I got specific as to the state. I mentioned New Jersey. She didn't ask me the state, as I recall. I very well may have mentioned Seabrook, and I mentioned a, uh, a number. To the best of my knowledge, it was in excess of 300. I don't specifically remember whether I said 326 or not, but I do remember saying 300. Uh, she told me that that was uh, a large number of units. She told me that uh, she mentioned something about phasing, which I didn't understand at the time, that that uh, size project uh, uh, might have to be phased, uh, done at more than, more than one time, 200 units and then 100 units. And then she asked me specifically whether or not an application had been put in by the authority. I told her that I did not know at that time. She then asked me uh, if you they... You still are not sure whether at that point you had mentioned the word Seabrook? If I had mentioned Seabrook, sir, it well, how could they have put in a request if you didn't mention any? 
How, how, how could they? I don't understand, sir. Well, you were now, you're moving now from the general discussion, this sort of theoretical, platonic discussion about the availability of mod rehab funding. And Ms. Dean reassures you that, in fact, the program is still in existence. At that point, she may have even told you it is being cut back, but we still have some units. So we now satisfy your general curiosity about the continuance of the program. Now, how do we get from that general statement to the state of New Jersey? You raise the question of New Jersey. That's correct, sir. And in what context do you raise New Jersey? I, you, I, you don't ask whether units might be available for New Jersey, because theoretically, they obviously could be available for New Jersey. They could be available for New Mexico, Arizona, and another 47 states. Well, in fact, sir, that may be what exactly my conversation was with her. I mean, I might have asked her about the availability uh, of mod rehab units, and then specifically I talked about New Jersey. And what was your And I very well may have at that time mentioned Seabrook, which would have been prior to her asking me about the application. Yeah, one would think so. Not having been party to that conversation, it would seem to me that after she satisfies you, your curiosity that the program is still in existence. Had I been in your boots with the task that you had, I would have said, I want to talk to you about a particular project in the state of New Jersey called Seabrook for which we would need 326 units. You never made such a statement. Excuse me one second, Congressman. That's correct. Uh, perhaps I'm not making myself clear, Congressman. That seems uh, obvious. Uh, I'm trying to indicate to you the exact conversation that you asked me to recall during those three or four minutes. My first inquiry was to the general availability of mod rehab funding, which, as you so stated, she mentioned to me that there was still funding available. Right. My next question, or her next question to me, either would have been the size of the number of units that I was talking about. That's a non sequitur. I mean, she doesn't even at that point know what state you are talking about. I, I was about to finish my sentence, Mr. Chairman, where she either asked me at that time the number of units that I was inquiring about or the state. I don't remember which. I'm trying to you recall... You mean she initiated the, the conversation about Seabrook. You didn't. No, sir. I, I, I stopped her on the way out of the meeting and we met. I talked to her about mod rehab in general. She told me that, yes, that funding was still available. I then talked to her about, I believe, Seabrook, New Jersey. It could have been just New Jersey. I discussed with her the number of units. She mentioned the phasing. A number of, number of units of what? Mod rehab funding, sir. I mentioned to her the... Yeah, but if you were talking about the number of units, you were talking about 326 units and the Seabrook project. Isn't that true? I was, yes, sir, I, I can't tell you whether or not I specifically said 326 or not. I might have been aware of the exact number. I knew that the number was over 300, sir. And you did mention at that point Seabrook. Is that your testimony I very, now? I very well may have, sir. I'm not. But you may I, not have. I, I may not have mentioned Seabrook. Well, but I give me the scenario according to which you don't mention Seabrook. How, how would then the conversation have unfolded? I, quite, quite frankly, Congressman, I don't see that the conversation would have changed one way or the other, whether I'd mentioned Seabrook or well, not, I'm willing... Of course it would have, because then she wouldn't have asked you whether the Public Housing Authority has applied for Seabrook. Well, is, I, the state of New Jersey had a state housing authority. I am aware of that. But the state of New Jersey housing officials were told that these are coming out of the discretionary fund of the secretary, and they are usable exclusively for Seabrook. That's the testimony we had earlier. If you let me finish my conversation, we can probably get Please. to that next meeting. Thank you. Uh, we then discussed the number of units. She then asked me if an application what was... What number of units? The number of units that I I'd said, 300 units, sir. I either told her 300 units or she inquired as to the number of units. I don't remember which question units, came first. What? The number of units you were interested for your project? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
So you did tell her at that point that you had a project you were interested in? I don't know if I use the word project, sir, the term project. I do remember specifically talking about New Jersey, the availability of mod rehab units. I do remember specifically mentioning 300 plus units. I do remember her questions of me, which is, one, did the authority have an application in? And if it did not, when they put an application in or if they were going to put an application in, would I supply her with a copy of that application? And I told her that, yes, I would. Was the word one, was I would inquire as to whether or not there was an application pending. And if there was not and one was going to be uh, requested, then I would supply her with a copy. Did the concept of the secretary's discretionary units come up at that point? I, I don't remember that coming you up, sir. Remember. Did Ms. Dean tell you at that uh, moment that you should send her a blind carbon copy uh, of the application? No, sir. At no time do I recall blind carbon copy being mentioned. And quite frankly, after Mr. Manafort's last testimony, uh, I, I tried to recollect that. And in no way do I remember uh, she asking or I suggesting that a blind carbon copy be sent. Was there any discussion at that point of avoiding the uh, regional office and going directly to New York? No, sir. Not to my knowledge. I, I, I don't remember her giving me any specific information as to when where the application should be When you left Ms. Dean's sent. office at that point, what was your impression? What kind of a commitment did she make to you? As I indicated, she made no commitment. She did ask me if an application uh, was pending, and if not, if one were to be made, would I please uh, uh, copy her on that application. Why? I, 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 would, I knew that she was involved in the process, and I assumed she wanted a copy of the application. Well, a lot of paper was flowing through her desk. I have difficulty visualizing her being passionately interested in this particular application. Well, I was talking to her about this specific application, sir. Did you request her support for this application? I, I don't know if I re those were my words, but I certainly was implying by inquiring about the availability of funds, and specifically for New Jersey, that I hoped that she would be supportive. And what was her indication to you? Her indication to me, as I can recollect very distinctly, was to supply her with a copy of the application uh, when such application would be presented if it hadn't been already. But she was sphinx-like in terms of not making any comment as to whether she was going to be supportive or not? I, I don't know, Congressman. I, I can't comment on, on, on what her uh, reaction was. I do well, know you're that... You're a very intelligent man. You went in to lobby her for 326 units for Seabrook. And when you walked out, you got some kind of an impression. That, that's it was either favorable or unfavorable yes, sir, or, in that context, or sphinx-like. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. In that context, I would say I felt that it was favorable. And why? I guess based on the fact that she wanted a copy of the application. But that was the only positive indication she gave you. I, it, as I can recall, yes, Mr. Chairman, that was um, what indicated to me that it was a favorable um, response. That's correct. We had earlier testimony from Mr. Pierce that in all instances when people went to him asking for such favors, he said, uh, we'll give it very careful consideration. Is that what she told you? I, I don't remember those words. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recollect her. Do you re recall any, any response from her? Uh, not other than I've testified. When you reported this conversation to Mr. Manafort. Was it Mr. Manafort you reported to? Yes, it was. Tell me exactly what you told him. I don't recollect this conversation as well as I did the one with Ms. Dean. Uh, I do remember reporting to Mr. Manafort. I, I don't know whether it was that same day or, or sometime shortly thereafter. And I reported to him the same thing that I've just testified today, that uh, is there an application pending? If not, uh, if one could be sent, that Ms. Dean would like a copy of that application. 
Did Mr. Manafort ask you what Ms. Dean's reaction was? I, I don't remember. I probably would have implied that by the mere conversation that I just had with it, said that she had requested a copy of the application. But Mr. Manafort, when you talked to him after the meeting with Ms. Dean, knew that you had discussed Seabrook with her. He knew that I was discussing Mod Rehab in New Jersey. I very well may have mentioned Seabrook, and I would have relayed to him the conversation that I've just relayed to you. And I did feel that it was favorable based on my testimony that she had asked for a copy, and I would have relayed that to Mr. Manafort. Tell me about the uh, degree of uh, involvement you have had with Mr. Tom Demery. I'm not sure when I first, uh, Mr. Demery's a friend, he's a personal friend. I'm not sure when I first met Mr. Demery. It would have been sometime probably in the summer, fall of 1986. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I was introduced to Mr. Demery uh, in Washington at a, at a social event. Uh, we talked, we uh, kept in touch with each other from time to time. He eventually became the Assistant Secretary for Housing at HUD. I recall having two lunches with him and I think two meetings during his time at HUD and a number of phone calls that I don't keep phone logs, so I would not have any knowledge as to how many phone were calls, your, but not very many. Were your discussions with him on the phone or in person related to HUD business or were they purely social? Uh, they were a combination, but there were times when we discussed HUD business. Can you tell us what HUD business you discussed with him? In the winter, early spring of 87, I met with Mr. Demery uh, in his office. And at that time, uh, specifically, that meeting was to ask him to come to Camden and to tour uh, the city of Camden and specifically the redevelopment project that we were involved in with the city uh, on the waterfront. Uh, as a new member of the, as a new assistant secretary and federal housing commissioner, I was inviting him to the city uh, informally, and uh, that was the basis for that meeting. In talking to subcommittee staff, you indicated you were involved in obtaining mod rehab units for Florida. That's correct. Can you tell us about that? The uh, Wadsworth project is a project that Mr. Manafort referred to um, earlier. Uh, it was um, in the fall of 1986 when I uh, would have had contact with Ms. Dean and she would have asked me to, and this was a phone call I recall, it was not a, not a meeting, and she asked me similarly, similar questions based on a conversation on Seabrook was an application pending, and if there was, would I supply her with a copy of uh, the application for mod rehab funding from the uh, Housing Authority, West Palm Beach Housing Authority and Palm Beach County Housing Authority. Ms. Manafort, what is your recollection of uh, your initial request of uh, Mr. Gay to discuss Seabrook with Ms. Dean? To find out about the availability of funds, I mean, I'm not certain that either of us knew at this stage whether the discretionary fund had been completely allocated or, in fact, uh, if there were funds available. So one of them would have been determine were there funds available, and then secondly, uh, what, what, uh, yeah, how we might proceed. I'm sorry? How we might proceed. Did you instruct Mr. Gay to discuss Seabrook with Ms. Dean? Instruct is a strong word. We discussed it and we agreed. Instruct is a descriptive word. It's not a strong word. Well, it implies that he was there under, uh, you know, the responsibility of raising it, and that was not the context. We were going to, I asked him to try to raise it with her. We were not certain if he'd have the opportunity, but if he had the opportunity, you know, the request was to try and raise the topic. And when he returned, what did he report to you? What he has re reported here today, that, uh, uh, that uh, funding was available. He asked if an application had been uh, submitted, uh, and I told him no. 
and he indicated that uh, she would want a copy of the application if we were going to submit one, uh, at which point we proceeded, as you know, to the next step. And the next step was? To set up the meeting in New Jersey. And when the meeting was set up in New Jersey, what, uh, and I'm using the word in a descriptive sense, what instructions did you give in terms of telling New Jersey about the availability of these units for Seabrook? I gave no instruction. Mr. Cruz, who was, went to the meeting, went to the meeting to describe the project, to see if we could get support from the, uh, from the Public Housing Authority, and if so, to have an application filed. Mr. Cruz was not told by you that uh, units will be forthcoming? We didn't feel at this time, Congressman, that we had a commitment. But I, I mean, I think, you know, there was a lot of tilting a few minutes ago. I would go so far as to say that we understood that by asking for the application, there was a willingness to at least be supportive. And hopefully that would mean that uh, the project could be funded. But the word that's been thrown around is commitment. And we didn't feel at that time a commitment uh, or a guarantee. Those are the two words that I take exception to, although we felt a willingness. Uh, and th we understood that in order to proceed in Washington, the PHA had to agree that the project was, uh, had to agree to submit an application for the project. That required a meeting with the PHA. The New Jersey housing people gave the impression that they were stunned by this when they, they were told that the project will be funded. Uh, I don't know that they were told that the project was going to be funded. I believe Mr. Ziegler uh, testified that well, let me, units... Let me, let me back up a bit because, because I, I, I have a feeling we are not getting the degree of candor from either of you gentlemen that I think the subcommittee is entitled to. There is a long, long distance, there is a long, long distance between Mr. Gay's general inquiry concerning the continuing availability of uh, mod rehab funding and the meeting in the office of the New Jersey housing officials where they are told this comes out of the secretary's discretionary fund get in your application right away, don't send it to the regional office, send it up to New York to Mr. Monticello, and you can't use it any other place. I mean, there is a, there is a tremendous gap here, which somehow you gentlemen will have to close, because you were the participants in these various conversations. Uh, I, I believe Mr. Cruz can tell you the topic of conversation in that meeting, Congressman, and maybe that'll enlighten well, you. Mr. Well, I think I'm fully en enlightened. I am just trying to have you state what is obvious. Uh, Mr. Cruz can merely report what he was told about the Dean meeting. Isn't that true? He was not at the Dean meeting. The only one who was at the Dean meeting who could talk to you about that is Mr. Gay, sir. Yes, and I have attempted to obtain from Mr. Gay an indication as to what Miss Dean said, and I'm still not quite sure I know what Miss Dean said. Uh, Mr. Gay then talked to you, and you then talked to Mr. Cruz. That is correct. Yes. What did you tell Mr. Cruz about the Gay Dean conversation, Miss Manifold? I would have told Mr. Cruz, as I said a minute ago, that Mr. Gay met with Miss Dean, that Miss Dean had uh, inquired as to the number of units that Ms. Dean had asked if there was an application. Well, she didn't inquire as to the number well, of units. Mr. Gay must have requested support for the Seabrook there, project. There was discussion of the number of units. There was discussion of whether an application had been submitted. And there was a request, if an application had been submitted, to supply it to her. All of which we would have taken as a very positive sign. And I would have probably said exactly that to Mr. Cruz. And Mr. Cruz would have then taken that information and had the meeting in New Jersey where I'm certain he, you know, he can speak better than I, would have made those same statements as well as describing the project. Uh, and I believe that testimony that Mr. Ziegler provided s says clearly exactly what our impressions were at that time, that there was a willingness to, to fund out of the discretionary fund. Uh, and we felt, if we, as we proceeded, that we could convert that 
into an actual program and ultimately project funding. Uh, but we, you know, we had to work through the process. And in hindsight, yes, it all looks like it was done in advance, uh, it, except it was a step-by-step -step process. Congressman Shays. I'd like to um, <clears throat> ask both of uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Gay. Uh, my understanding is, Mr. Davis, you worked um, at the White House for two years and three months. Is that correct? I'm sorry? You worked at the White House for two years and three months from basically February 85 to excuse me, you started in December 84 in the White House. Is that correct? Or? Uh, no, I started at the White House in August of 85. Okay. I started at HUD in December of 84. Okay. What was the White House's attitude? You were involved as in the Secretary of the Cabinet as the liaison to HUD. Um, and we've, we're fairly clear that there was hardly a part of HUD that worked well. And it was pretty common knowledge that HUD was an agency in problems. What was the White House's attitude about how HUD was operating? Congressman, while I was at the White House, my responsibilities uh, w included the development of policy. Um, as HUD related to the development of policy for the President of the United States, um, we saw no real problems with that. So it's your testimony under oath that, that there was never discussions that you had with anyone regards to any problems that existed at HUD, that there wasn't a problem at HUD. That's your testimony before this committee? Congressman, I'm not saying that there was never a problem at HUD while the entire time I spent in the White House. I think that's an oversimplification. I think what you need to understand, though, is that it was the responsibility of the Office of Management and Budget to worry about the concerns of management at HUD it was the responsibility that I had to communicate in my job at the White House policy recommendations and initiatives between the White House and the agencies. Was there any discussions that you had either with your superiors or with your associates that talked about any specific problems that existed at HUD? Um, no particular conversations about anything specific as far as a problem with respect to what I did at the White House. No, sir. I don't understand. Not that I can recall. So. You asked me were there any specific conversations that where we talked about problems at HUD, and I, I don't recall any specifics. I, I guess I'm having a hard time understanding the value of your job then. What, 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 were you, what basically was your responsibility? I mean, are, are, were you saying that HUD was working well and we just want to make it work better? I mean, you deal with policy. C Congressman, my job was to cover the domestic policy cabinet agencies. In that respect, I dealt with uh, formulation of the catastrophic health insurance program. It's now under discussion. Someone to blame for my vote. <laughs> well, I don't think I want to get into that anymore. I want to get into this. No, I'll take um, I, I, I also was responsible for NASA and helped develop the, the response to the Challenger shuttle disaster. I had plenty to keep me busy while I was at the White House. Um, as far as the development of housing policy, um, that was in the portfolio that I had, not one of the more rigorous chores. So is, is your testimony during the time that you were at the White House that you never advocated any changes to HUD, never got involved in any other policy issues? I never advocated any management changes at HUD, that's correct. How about programs? Um, I was not in the role of an advocate. I, one of the other things I think structurally you need to understand is my job was the communication of policy, you know, coordinating ideas that the agency had into the White House and ideas the White House had into the agencies. It was not specifically my responsibility to actually formulate that policy myself. Did, um, were you aware um, or had you ever heard that some felt that mod rehab projects were going for $1,000 a unit? No, I think the limitations while I was in the White House of what I knew about the mod rehab program uh, was in relation to the budget figures that we dealt with on, a, on an annual basis. Did you ever advocate any projects, any of the 21 projects, or become a facilitator for any one of the 21 projects that Black Manafort and Stone and Kelly worked on? I guess some of it was pre-Kelly, is that correct? So, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think so, sir. I, not that I can recall. Not as an advocate. So there, there wouldn't yeah. be, as far as you're concerned, any document or uh, or a conversation that you might have had that someone later would say, well, no, you called specifically about one of these projects. Well, I can't categorically say that I never called about any specific project. You asked me if I was an advocate for any, and I, I don't recall being an advocate. What's the difference? Um, it was routinely my job at the White House to take anything that came into the White House uh, dealing with HUD or any other cabinet agency and send it to that agency for disposition. Um, uh, from time to time, uh, representatives of Black Manafort and Stone would approach me on, on all kinds of issues, uh, HUD being just one of them. Uh, and I may have, from time to time, uh, sent a document uh, to HUD. Uh, there's only one instance that I can recall in respect to that. And what was that document? Uh, that's in uh, respect to uh, a program called uh, Waterbury, I believe, for discussions today, 86. Is this the project, Mr. Manafort, that never took off? Waterbury 86. Is this the Waterbury project? Waterbury, Waterbury 86, Congressman, uh, is the one that I was referring to that uh, Mr. Gay talked about contacting Ms. Dean on. Uh, we never, we never had a fee, and we, in the end, we never had a client in this matter. Um, Mr. Gay, did you, um, while you were at HUD, ever work on any project that ultimately uh, uh, that Black Manafort and Stone were, was involved in? No, sir, none. Okay. Um, I would just like to um, ask two more lines of question. Did you ever have? Um, what was your? How often, Mr. Davis? Uh, would you have been in contact with Deborah Gordine once a week, twice a week, once a day? While I was in the White House, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, daily. Daily. Um, were they of a political nature or were they, uh, I mean, what would, what would be the basic reason for contacting Ms. Dean? Um, the elements of my job that required me to deal with all the cabinet agency chiefs of staff or executive directors on a daily basis included from the most simple fact of getting this, the secretary's schedule or whoever was running the agency at the time, not mentioning HUD, but a lot of other has had vacancies, um, man, not managing, but accumulating those schedules on a daily basis, uh, identifying uh, what announcements or what kind of press activity may be taking place uh, during the course of the week or that day, and, uh, and certainly communicating cabinet members' schedules with regard to cabinet meetings and council meetings and subcommittee meetings that we had within the White House structure, and obviously communicating whatever policy decisions were being made by the President to those cabinet agencies. Mr. Gay, um, in your conversation about Seabrook, it seems to me that you're very reluctant to say what to me is obvious but not against the law. Uh, you had a task, and your task was to try to, um, uh, to see if you could get Seabrook funded. Um, why, why would you be uncomfortable in, um, at least it appears to me, and so this is, this is my bias, but my reaction to your testimony is that somehow you are not comfortable uh, with the fact that you went to, to, um, to Deborah Gordine, you wanted to know if projects were available, and you were advocating a particular project, which is the Seabrook project for 326 units, and things seemed to follow after that. Why would you be uncomfortable with that? With that, are, are you uncomfortable? I, I am not uncomfortable with that, sir, uh, Congressman. That's Do you a summation it? of exactly what took place okay. uh, at that meeting. But, but why, if that's the case, why, what did you know that some people didn't know, that Deborah Gordeen was the major player? I mean, one of the people didn't seem to know was the Inspector General, um, who actually works out of there. But why, how did you know that Deborah Gordeen was the center and almost the circumference of this activity. Well, I, I never knew one that she was a major player or, or the circumference. I knew that she was a player. It's your testimony to this committee after all that we've gathered. Um, did you learn something new since then? I mean, did you say, "Boy, I really I hit the lottery well. I went to the right person." Or Congressman, I was answering the question in the context of right. the time frame, which would have been November of 1986, okay. and what, at which time I knew she was a player. Certainly not a major player. Okay. Who did you think the major players were? Pardon me? Who did you think the major players were? I, I have no knowledge of who a major player might be or that there was a major player. I knew she was a participant, one of them. That's correct. Who did you think made the decision on mod rehab projects? 
I, I don't know who ultimately made the decisions. I knew that she was, you know, involved in making those decisions. Okay. Would it have been wrong for you to know that she was the major player? I, I don't think it would have been wrong. I just. But it's your testimony under oath that y you went to her because she was the chief of staff you know, or executive, but but you had no way of knowing under oath that that she was a, really almost the major player that no. she had a. Did, did you know Tom Demery at the time? Well, let me deal with the first yeah, question, if I, if I may, uh, which I believe is that I know she was a player. Yes, I did know she was a player in the Mod Rehab Allocation Funding. Okay. Did I know at the time that she was the player or a major player? No, I did not. Now, how did you know that she was a player? Who told you that she was a player? I, Congressman, I, I, I really have no recollection of knowing at the time of why I knew she was a player. I may have talked to her about Mod Rehab funding at some time. and. Uh, you know, I do remember uh, talking to her about the Wadsworth project, and at that time she asked me to supply her with an application, which I did. That was prior to Seabrook, so I naturally would have gone back to Ms. Dean and uh, asked her about uh, the Seabrook project. Am I to basically infer that, that the logic that you had at the time was, heck, if she's the chief of staff or the secretary and she likes the project, that's got to be helpful to us? Is that, I mean, is basically, that? Basically, that's correct, sir, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me explore that, that very last area with you. When, when you left, Ms. Dean, you had no guarantee, but you felt that you had a fairly solid assurance that, in fact, things were going to work out okay. Is that right? Uh, it's correct that I had no guarantee, and no, I did not have a fairly, I, I don't remember your last words, but I did not have a guarantee, sir, and I was not fully assured or fairly assured that this program was going to be funded. I felt that she received my uh, questions favorably, as I indicated to the chairman, but, uh, and, and, and by, do so by asking for an application, but I don't believe that uh, I uh, had any guarantee. I know I didn't have any guarantee, and uh, my belief then was not that uh, this was something that was... Uh, going to happen. Well, Mr. Manafort, you had spoken with Mr. Gay after his meeting with, uh, with Ms. Dean, is that correct? Yes, sir. And on the basis of what Mr. Gay told you at that time, right after the meeting, you had an expectation that, in fact, the project would be funded. Isn't that correct? Again, expectation is, a too, is too strong a word. I felt good about the process going forward, uh, and, uh, but it, to say that from that moment on, we felt it was a done deal, to use the words in this committee, uh, would be a mistake. No, I asked you if you had an expectation, and you said what? I you said felt good about felt it, but no expectation? Well, an expectation, but not a commitment or a guarantee. The two words I guess I take exception to would be commitment or guarantee. No, no, I asked you if you had an expectation after your conversation with Mr. Gay that, in fact, the deal would be followed through on that we could proceed with the deal and if you know everything continued to go forward uh, things would move favorably you're, you're trying to pin me to words when I'm dealing with emotions sir and uh, well, I must tell you mr. mr. Manafort I'm not trying to pin you to words I'm trying to pin you to your words the chairman said before that he had some concern about the extent of candor with which the testimony today is forthcoming and I've been going through the transcript of your last appearance. And my uh, sense of what's going on here has really heightened. And I don't know what, what you, why you're doing what you're doing, because I will quote your language, OK? Mr. Manafort, uh, Mr. Lantos, from whom did you obtain indications that the application would be approved? This is page 105 of the transcript. Mr. Manafort. The conversations that Mr. Gay had with Ms. Dean led us to believe at that time, whatever process HUD would take that the program, I'll go so far as to say, would be funded. But there was no guarantee it was going to be funded. I guess is the quibbling. Expectation, yes. Guarantee, no. That's all I'm saying. Now, that, that's what you said up front when you appeared before us the last time. In and now, in, in this area, and a number of other areas, you are playing verbal games with us, and I don't understand why you are doing that. Now, 
it, it, if you set expectation and you were very clear in spelling out, I'll go so far as to say would be funded, I guess is the clear expectation, yes, guarantee no. That's what I, I use yeah. the word expectation, and I was really quoting from page 105 of your testimony the last time. And, and I guess and I, I, I will live with that word. I also said there, and I can't remember the exact quotes of everything I've said here, although it's the implications that I'm trying to deal with, that the guarantee or commitment is what I have a problem with, sir. And I asked you expectation. Well, I will stand by the statement that's uh, on page 105, sir. I have no problem with that statement. But the point that seems to be... You have no be problem with the statement that after your conversation with Mr. Gay, after his conversation with Ms. Dean, that you were able to say that you would go so far as to say that the program would be funded. You have no problem. That's what you said, and that's what you stand by. Is that correct? Uh, in, in the context, and I haven't reviewed it all there, I don't know where the conversation was going. I don't have a problem with that. What I do feel I can comfortably say to move all the rhetoric away is that from that meeting, yes. from that meeting, there was not a guarantee that but there was an expectation, and so, so having that expectation, you then conveyed that, I assume, to Mr. Cruz. Is that correct? Did you, did you convey your impression of what you garnered from Mr., your conversation with Mr. Gay to Mr. Cruz? I would have communicated that, yes. Okay, and so then Mr. Cruz goes to meet with Mr. Ziegler at, this, at the New Jersey State Housing People's Office, and he then conveys your expectation, is that correct? You can ask Mr. Cruz what he conveyed, sir. I don't, Mr. I don't Cruz, want to Mr. Cruz, did you convey Mr. Manafort's expectation? Congressman Weiss, I didn't know what Mr. Manafort's expectations were when I went to New Jersey. When I went to New Jersey, I went to explain to, uh, I didn't know who I was going to meet with when I went to New Jersey. When I went to New Jersey, I met with Mr. Ziegler. I indicated to him about the project the 326 units. He was well familiar with the project. I indicated to him that I thought the units would be coming from the Secretary's discretionary fund, the availability of those units. At no time would I have taken or presumed that we had a commitment for those units because I was going to try to convince the New Jersey <coughs> Department of Community Affairs to apply for those units. And this in point of fact, you did persuade them because your meeting took place when? When did your meeting take place with Mr. Ziegler? My meeting took place with Mr. Ziegler on November 19th. And on November 20th, on November 20th, an application goes forward from the New Jersey State Housing Office. Isn't that correct? That is very correct, Congressman. But when so I left that, that meeting... So that, in fact, your meeting of the 19th, followed immediately by what happened on the 20th, indicates that you were successful in persuading them that they ought to put that application forward because, as Mr. Connolly said, we were told, submit the application, the approval will be forthcoming, and lo and behold, it did. So why, why are we playing all of these verbal games, Mr. Uh, Manafort? I mean, this uh, is what you testified to the last time around. Congressman, that is exactly right. They seem to be verbal games, because if you look at the whole context of, on page 105, I am asked, is it accurate? And I say, I don't want to be quibbling. There was an expectation, yes. I don't want to be a party to the, con I wasn't a party to the conversation, so I cannot quote it exactly. I then go on to say, but one of the points that needs to be stressed here is we are hopeful that the program will be funded. I'm then asked, how high were your expectations? And I say they were not so high, I wasn't concerned. That's what I'm trying to express here. If I'm not no, articulating it. No, 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 please, it, please. Go, and then go on. It, I'll go so far as to say would be funded. That's your language. And, I have, and what I'm saying is that communicates the feeling. Now, if I'm not articulating it, I apologize. What you're articulating is that you're trying to double back. No, sir. On your conversation. I don't understand why. Okay, no, sir. Let's, let's, go to, let's go to another area. We had a discussion on the first round as to how the term influence peddling was used. And you said, and I'm almost quoting, I'm paraphrasing, you said, I, Manafort, said lobbying. It was you, Weiss, who said influence peddling. Okay, now let's go to page 147 of the transcript. And go to the, at, the, at line 3518, Mr. Weiss, you said all along that you, would, you could characterize what you did as influence peddling, Mr. Manafort. For purposes of discussion today, you could say that. 
as to why lobbying involves legislative bodies. Mr. Manafort, no, I don't define it as just dealing with the Congress of the United States. In this town, it would not be viewed in that narrow complex. Mr. Weiss, this is lobbying and influence peddling. Mr. Manafort, I will stipulate this for today as influence peddling. Now, that's not me saying that. You are stipulating for today as influence peddling. Congress that was the last time you appeared before us. Congressman, very clearly, if you look at, I mean, you brought me through it and we're playing word games here again, but very clearly on 3520, I said you, and if you go back, Congressman, to page 83, I believe, when I got into the whole discussion and I was trying to put everything into perspective for you, on line 1945, I described the term and I summarized it as lobbying and I said, quote, for purposes of today, I will admit in a narrow sense, you, some might term it influence penalty. I don't have a problem with some people term it. You are stipulating. You go on to say, I will stipulate for today. It is influence peddling. No. Did you say that? I've said what's in the record there, Congressman. And that's what you said. That's what's in the record, right? In the context in which I've explained it, yes. Okay, let's go to the discussion about the at risk that you were at. Because we went through that discussion last time around also. And after you attempted to use some of the same arguments about how much at risk you were and how the public advertising, in fact, in some fashion, kept you at risk. Let's go to page 188 of the transcript. And in questioning, I ask you it, that, that, in fact, it's more than just having 100 units. They were in paragraph two of the public notice of advertising, a number of other conditions, five, six other conditions that were set forth. And I say, one, the other criteria has to meet, one, projects with applications previously submitted but not funded by previous awards. And I ask you now, do you know of any other project with applications previously submitted but not funded by previous awards within either Upper Deerfield Township or Seabrook Subdivision? Mr. Manafort, no, I do not. Now, did you remember getting that question, giving that answer? Y yes, sir. Okay. Next, Mr. Weiss, two, feasible projects providing the greatest dollar amount of rehabilitation per unit. What does that mean to your understanding, Mr. Manafort? I'm giving you my present knowledge, the total amount of rehab per unit would be a per criteria. Mr. Weiss, the most expensive, Mr. Manafort, no, in other words, if you were going to put in $1,000 per unit or $2,000 per unit, you'd be given preference by putting in more rehab money. Mr. Weiss, three, projects involving abandoned or foreclosed buildings, criteria. Now I ask you now, do you know of any other project in Upper Deerfield or the Seabrook subdivision which had abandoned or foreclosed buildings besides the one that you purchased. Mr. Manafort, I don't know of any. Dan, do you remember getting that question and giving that answer? Yes, sir. And then, next, Mr. Weiss, projects whose, whose unit size distribution most closely matches the agency's distribution. That is for what? Mr. Manafort, I don't understand. I say, as I read the funding authorizations for 326 units, you have it. You are the only one who can meet that criteria unless by some magic there's another project meeting that criteria which also has exactly 226 units. Five, project shortest time period at five. You've gone through the questions and answers which spell out why in fact that advertising, advertisement was so tailored as to apply only to you and you acknowledge that the last time you appeared. Now you come before the subcommittee and you find all kinds of rationalizations and explanations as to why, in fact, you were still at risk because somebody could have applied or responded to that ad when, in fact, you, you told us months ago that that was an impossibility. I, so why I, are you doing that? I don't see where you reach that conclusion here, Congressman. I don't see that at all. Well, okay. I mean, you know, if, if, if you can't, you can't, but I, we've just gone through the questions that were asked, the answers that you gave. I mean, it seems to me fairly clear cut. Well. It doesn't to me, sir. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, guess, I guess that you have more difficulty comprehending the English language than I thought that you had. Uh, the, and finally, I thought that Mr. Kyle made a, an excellent point when he asked you. And, and you gave an answer, I thought, which was honest, too. 
he said, well, assuming that all this advertising stuff was not a sham, that in fact, by some circumstance, somebody else could have qualified, that is the owner, uh, the person who sold you the property had some more properties available to sell, and he was the only one, you said, who had property available. He said, well, if he were responsible for making it impossible for you to perform, you would not have your monies at risk. Isn't that correct? And you said yes. Remember being asked that question and giving that answer? It's been a long afternoon, Congressman. I don't, but if that's what the record says, I'll, I'll agree to it. And, in fact, do you agree to that? That if, in fact, the, the person who sold you the 326 units through his act in putting a bid in, to compete with you made it impossible for you to perform that you would not have lost your four hundred twenty-five or four hundred fifty thousand dollars. I, you've got me all confused. If you're saying if he chose to not execute, would we have been reimbursed our money? Is that what the thrust no, of the no, question? No, 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 no. The question that Mr. Kyle asked you was: supposing, in fact, the owner yeah. of the properties uh, that were sold to you you said he had still some other properties left as well, decided that he would compete with you, he would put in the bid, and Hutz selected his bid, and that made it impossible for you to execute because you would not have the deal, he would have the deal. You, Kyle asked you, isn't it a fact that you would then not be at risk because, in fact, he made it impossible for you to perform, and you said that's right. If he was bidding his own, uh, I don't, the context, uh, and again, it's late in the afternoon, I don't remember the whole context of what Mr. Kyle was saying, although at the time, frankly, it seemed a lot clearer than it does right now. Um, there, if we defaulted on the contract, we were at risk for that money. It was gone, the way the, the, way the 4 9 agreement was written. If he bid against us yes. using the other units, that would not have necessarily impacted on this agreement, and we would have, uh, we'd have you know, been that's, that's at risk. That's a different answer than that, that which you gave him earlier. Today. No, I, well, again, I don't remember the context, yeah. uh, but I think what he was, yeah. what Congressman Kyle may have, well, I don't remember the context, so it, I'm confused how, I mean, it seemed very clear when I was yeah. talking to him, uh, but you and I seem to have a problem communicating. Well, I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I have no further questions. Just in, in, in summary, the thing that perturbs me about the testimony would be, it's one thing when somebody comes in and says, listen, I gave you some responses the last time around, I find that I'm in error. And in fact, uh, Mr. Manafort did that in re regard to, to uh, some of the other clients that he had, and he sent forward letters into correcting the record. That's one thing. It's another thing to come back here and try to obfuscate the testimony and to give totally different responses than that which were given the last time that he appeared, and then try to suggest that, in fact, the answers are not different than the ones that, that were given last time. I think that that's a different way of playing games with the subcommittee, and I, for one, don't appreciate it. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, if I just might, I'm sorry that you have that feeling. We have done the best we could, and I know that I could, to provide you fully and completely, to the best of our knowledge, the facts. Uh, and, and I would hope that when you go back and read the transcripts of today, uh, and compare them to the transcripts of June, June 20, that you will find there's a consistency. Uh, Impossible. Congressman Wise. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to try not to replay all ground. I do have just a couple of questions. In following a line of questioning from uh, Congressman Wise, um, he went from Mr. Gay to Mr. Manafort to Mr. Cruz. Um, in terms of expectation versus uh, uh, guarantee or whatever, but I'm a little confused, Mr. Cruz, because uh, you testified that when you met in the offices of the New Jersey Housing Authority that you did not leave them. You did not tell them that there was a definite commitment um, that you had anything locked up. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. Are you then uh, challenging or contradicting Mr. Conley's testimony, who testified, and I'm sure it's been read here earlier today also, um, and I'm reading from his transcript, page 186, that the next day at 11.30 in the morning, Victor Cruz met with Mr. Ziegler in, the, in our offices in Trenton. They indicated they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. That would be Mr. Conley's testimony. I believe that's Mr. Conley's Will testimony. Can you tell me which line, Congressman? Um, I'm reading excerpts. I apologize. It's page 186 of Mr. Conley's testimony. Yeah, 
Where? 186. Who you want? All right, I have it, Congressman. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Ziegler uh, clarifies that on the next page, Congressman. Okay, I'm, I'm uh, getting Page 187. Clear. All right, well, then, then let me stick with, let me get my uh, right. un unabridged copy. Okay. Keep fire it away. says, uh, Mr. Ziegler, quote from, from line 4502, Mr. Cruz indicated there were HUD sec secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook. And that would have been exactly what I would have indicated to Mr. Ziegler, and I would have indicated to that to him whether I had talked with Mr. Manafort or not. I had prior knowledge because I was the Deputy Commissioner of Housing of the Secretary's Discretionary Fund. If I were going to ask him to apply for Section 8 units, they would have been having to come from some particular program. And everyone in the business was knowledgeable of the fact that Section 8 mod rehab units were in the Secretary's Discretionary Fund. At no time was I aware on November 19th that of a commitment, uh, whatever the uh, expectations, guarantee, whatever. I was not aware that Mr. Manafort had a high expectation. That's my recollection, Congressman. That's the truth. I'm under oath here today. And as far as I'm concerned, when I left on the 19th, I was not aware that the Department of Community Affairs for New Jersey was going to send an application on the 20th. When I left, Mr. Ziegler indicated to me that he would be talking to his superiors. Do you feel then that uh, Mr. Conley, in that statement that I read to you on page 186, is he overstating? Can I can't opinion? speak for uh, Mr. Conley. Will my colleague yield Certainly. for a moment? <clears throat> Let's go back to Certainly. Ziegler's statement. Certainly. <laughs> on page 187. I'm going to give you a parallel sentence, Mr. Cruz, and I want you to interpret it for me. Someone indicated that there were theater tickets available for Congressman Shays. Does that mean that some theater tickets are set aside for him? I don't know, Congressman. Well, of course you do. You're a very intelligent man. I know I'm and a very intelligent man. And as you stated a minute ago, you are under oath. I read the Ziegler statement. I'll direct you to answer it. The Ziegler statement reads as follows. Mr. Cruz indicated that there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available. There's no period there for the project at Seabrook. That's English. That means for the project at Seabrook, there are HUD secretarial discretionary funds available. That's what Mr. Ziegler's testimony is under oath which is fully in consonance with what he reported to his boss. Mr. Connolly wasn't at the meeting. He found out about the meeting from Mr. Ziegler. And after he did, this is what he said. They indicated that they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. Now, are you suggesting that Mr. Ziegler deliberately misled his boss? Or are you suggesting that Mr. Ziegler told his boss exactly what happened? I see absolutely no difference between the Ziegler and Connolly testimony. They're exactly the same. Ziegler reported to Connolly, and Connolly under oath tells us, you told him you had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. And then Ziegler confirms it. I the only one who is out of line is the testimony we are getting from this table. Ziegler and Connolly are together. Congressman. I'd like Mr. Cruz to comment first, then I'll give you a chance to comment. Excuse me, is there a question here? Uh, just a moment. We will, uh, you are counsel for which witness? All the witnesses at the table. Would you identify yourself? My name is Tom Steindler. I'm sorry? Tom Steindler. We'll be coming to you shortly. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Cruz. I don't know how to comment to your uh, Well, my question is this. Is there a conflict between Mr. Connolly's and Mr. Ziegler's testimony? I cannot comment on Mr. Connolly's or Mr. Ziegler's statement, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, of course you can. What you I'm can doing, read it. What I am doing is providing you under oath 
what I did at the meeting of November 19th. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Well, let me read you Mr. Connolly's testimony again. They indicated that they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. Is that true? Is that what you indicated to them? Absolutely not. So you are contradicting Mr. Connolly's testimony. I am telling you that I did not say to Mr. Ziegler at the meeting of the 19th that there was a commitment for funds. Absolutely not. Are you contradicting Mr. Ziegler's testimony? He says, Mr. Cruz indicated that there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook. You I, didn't tell him that. I am not contradicting Mr. Ziegler's testimony. I'm clarifying it. No, you are not clarifying his testimony. That's up to him. Well, Mr. You either agree with it or you disagree with well, it. Well, Mr. Ziegler is, was testifying as to what I said. That's right. And I'm here to tell you what I said, Mr. Chairman. And what I said to him was programmatic information that the Section 8 moderate rehab units would be coming from the discretionary fund. That's not what he says. He says they were available for the project at Seabrook. Available. For the project at Seabrook. Fine. Well, I'm not asking you to, to accommodate me. I'm asking you whether you agree with that <laughs> statement or not. What I agree to is what I indicated I said to Mr. Ziegler. That's not the question you are directed to answer the question, Ms. Cruz. Would you repeat the question for me, Mr. I will. Chairman? Thank you. Quoting from Mr. Ziegler's sworn testimony, Mr. Cruz indicated that there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook. Was that an accurate statement? I don't have a recollection that I said to Mr. Ziegler that there were HUD funds available for that there were HUD funds available from the Secretary's discretionary FOC for Seabrook. <coughs> I do have a recollection that in response to, either in response to a question or in providing Mr. Ziegler with information about our project and what we hope to do with the project, that the funds would be available from the Secretary's discretionary fund. He was already aware of where the, where the project was, Mr. Chairman. I was only going to... I'm not to asking you about the project. Right. I'm asking you about the availability of funds for the Seabrook project, which is his sworn testimony. You agree with that? I don't agree with that You specific, don't agree with I don't that. agree with that specific characterization, Mr. Chairman. I was only going to speak to Mr. Ziegler about one project. That was the Seabrook project. That's right. And you told him that the funds are available for that project. That's his testimony. That's Mr. Ziegler's testimony. Yeah, and you dispute it. I don't dispute his testimony. You agree with it. It's on the record. You are either in agreement with that statement or you dispute that statement. That's his inter that's I'm not asking it's a difference what his between interpretations, Mr. Chairman. No, no. I'm asking you, do you agree with Mr. Ziegler's statement or do you dispute Mr. Ziegler's statement? I don't dispute Mr. Ziegler's statement. Therefore you agree with his statement. You've got me caught between a rock and a hard place here, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm just asking you to tell the truth. I am telling the truth. And, and I you said either I... agree or you dispute it. What I told Mr. Ziegler... No, I'm asking you whether you agree with this statement or do you dispute this statement. I can't answer that question, Mr. Chairman. You are directed to answer the question. I mean it. I mean, I think you're entitled to that. He wants to... May I address the chair? Yes, you may. Thank you. Uh, the, these witnesses are here voluntarily. They're doing the best they can to answer the question. When they're not able to answer the question, uh, it seems to me that, that asking them to, or directing them to answer the question is, is to no avail. I think... Uh, uh, well, I appreciate your, your judgment, counsel. I will read the statement one more time. The statement is a very simple statement. And Mr. Cruz will either agree with it or he will dispute it. I am unaware of any third option. Mr. For my own satisfaction, the one thing uh, Mr. Cruz is entitled to is to consult his attorney. Of course he is. And I just want to make sure that that happens, so if you want to. Take all the time you need to consult your attorney.
You are ready to answer. Please yes, go ahead. As you are characterizing Mr. Ziegler's statement, Mr. Chairman. I'm reading it. I'm not characterizing it. As you are characterizing, I dispute it because that is not what I indicated to Mr. Ziegler. You will read the statement and then you will say whether you agree with it or not. I won't characterize it. You read the statement, Mr. Cruz. I say what I read it out loud, please. Page 187, line 4502. Mr. Cruz indicated that there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook. Is this an accurate statement? I don't, I don't recollect whether I said that specifically. I thank my colleague for yielding. Congressman, if I might just finish one point. Yes. I think the impression that we're trying to deal with, and I understand where you're going, is was there a guarantee or and was there statements made about a guarantee that the units would be available? And that strong a characterization would be reaching. Now, what people's impressions were of what others said, one can only you know, be, you know, rely on what the people say their impressions were. What I think the three of us are consistently saying, General, uh, Congressman, is that the meeting with Ms. Dean that Mr. Gay had did not shut the door. And if anything left oh, the door, you know, I was about to say, Manifold, if anything left ask, the door wide open let for me us ask to proceed. You, let me ask you this question. Suppose, suppose you ask someone in your office to call the Kennedy Center and get you two tickets to a play. And then the answer comes back that there are tickets available for Mr. Manafort at the Kennedy Center. What does that mean in English? That means now I need to go and buy the tickets. That's right. And they're set aside for you. They're waiting for you. That's exactly what it means. But if I don't go on time, they may not be there. I mean, the analogy isn't direct. I mean, the, the point we're trying to make... Oh, come on. Come on, Mr. Manafort. Uh, you know, they, I'm trying to be specific, Congressman. No, no, you are trying to be evasive. You're all trying to be no, evasive. When in fact, as my colleague pointed out, what you did was probably not illegal, but it certainly, it certainly was highly questionable in terms of ethics, propriety, the purposes of these programs, and the denial of these funds to infinitely more worthy projects than this one. And you are dancing around it. And you are in the process insulting the intelligence, not just of this committee, but of the American people. Everybody knows what the facts are, reading the record, listening to you, and seeing what happened. And you are just refusing not very successfully, I might add, to face up to the facts of what happened. That you had a sweetheart deal, that this deal was greased. Everybody, know, everybody knows it. Uh, the, the head of the New Jersey Housing Authority said, uh, uh, and lo and behold, the, fund were, the funds were there. They, they were amazed at the magic you folks created. And the magic came from influence peddling, and we all know it, and you know it. 
and Connolly knows it, and every reader of the Wall Street Journal knows it. Congressman Wise. Just to, to follow on the chairman's question, I'd, I'd like to ask each, um, each of you to address this question. Um, if a commitment had been made by Deborah Dean in that meeting to make these funds available, would, have that, would that have been improper? If so, how? And if not, why not? Mr. Mr. Cruz. I think that would be a legal judgment that I'm not prepared to make. Uh, you don't have an opinion on whether it would be proper or not? Well, I think that the committee is investigating. Uh, well, uh, really, I, I don't want to take up any too much of the gentleman's time. For the, I think we know what we're doing. Um, so the question really is, in your opinion, would it or would it not have been proper to have gotten a commitment at that point? I, I mean, within your knowledge, I'm know. not asking for a legal opinion, whatever your knowledge is. I don't know. Uh, you have no idea? I don't know. Mr. Manafort? I don't know it would have been proper, but I know that we would not have done anything that we thought was improper. You don't know, though, whether it would have been proper? Uh, we, would done, we would have done nothing that we thought was improper. Now, you're, th that moves, th wh when we met with her, we weren't doing anything improper. And as we proceeded from there, we felt we were working within the system and, uh, and working properly within the system. Mr. Gay? Uh, I have no opinion on that, Congressman. You have no opinion? No, sir. Now, the same question, if the letter from the uh, New Jersey Department of Community Affairs of March 30th was a commitment to you, was there any problem with that? Same three people, please. The letter of the 30th Congressman, I didn't consider a commitment. No, I don't, yeah, I know that. We, we, we've been round and round that tree. I want to ask you if, in your opinion, there would be anything wrong with it if we concluded that that was a commitment. Is there anything wrong with that being a commitment? I, to my knowledge, I don't know why there would be anything wrong, but I haven't researched the issue. But no, I don't think anything would be wrong. So it would be okay if you got a commitment at that point? I don't know why it wouldn't be. Okay. Mr. Cruz? At that point, uh, they didn't have anything to commit to us, Congressman. Well, they had a, an allocation of units specifically directed to come to you or at least to your project or at least to a 326-unit project where yours happened to be located. Congressman, not on the 30th, they, they didn't. They had a notice, I believe, by the 30th of March, of an, uh, a notice to f that they were going to be receiving notification to fund, but I don't think that any of the allocation had actually arrived at the PHA by the 30th. I, I may be wrong on that, but I don't believe that the allocation left until April 24th, the notification that would be the basis upon which the PHA could, could uh, move forward, I don't believe, arrived until May 1. Well, you want, your answer was you didn't see any problem with it being a commitment. This letter, I, I see no problem with it at all. With it being a commitment. Your answer, Mr. Cruz? I don't know what they would have been committing on March 30th, 1987, Congressman. Mr. Gay? Uh, I don't see it as a commitment. Congressman. Well, I, that wasn't the question. Okay. Can you repeat the question, please? The question is, if that we were to view that as a commitment, is there anything wrong with it? Is there any problem with it being a commitment? Do you see any problem in it being a commitment? It would be difficult for me to base a judgment, Congressman, because this, this letter is – are you asking me something other than what this letter states? I don't – No, I, I'm, I, we can read the letter and we can decide – we can all decide whether we think it's a commitment. I'm asking you whether, in your opinion, there's anything wrong with them making a commitment to you in, at that time. I, I have no opinion. I'm sorry, Mr. Wise, to have wasted okay. your time on that. Um, Mr. Cruz, let's uh, – get back to where we were. Um, and I think that your conversation with the chairman has uh, taken up enough time on uh, that line by Mr. Conley on page 186. But let me then ask, have you read Mr. Conley's testimony? Yes, I have. Okay. Because you know that he goes on from page 186 um, all the way at least to page 210. And he talks about irregularities in the procedure. 
Uh, for instance, uh, looking at page 187, he talks about, uh, uh, and that's where the line is uh, from Mr. Ziegler testifying, Mr. Cruz indicated there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available for the project at Seabrook. Mr. Conley then goes on to say that the, uh, and I'm paraphrasing that the procedure seemed to be a bit irregular. He was being asked by Mr. Stevens, who was in your meeting also, wasn't he? Yes, yeah. he was. He was being asked to apply, first of all, to the regional office of HUD in New York. That wasn't normal. Uh, that's Mr. Connolly's words. Um, he then um, goes on page 188 on line 4525 to begin saying, normally the invitation comes from the HUD area office. In this case, uh, since it was HUD discretionary funds, I assumed, that's Mr. Ziegler speaking, I assumed we'd go through the regional administrator's office. He then goes on. Uh, he goes on down the line to say that uh, he bypassed, at line 4542, he bypasses the area HUD office. Um, he then goes on to say that, or Mr. Conley goes on to say on page 189, top of the page, that Mr. Stevens asked him to forward a copy of the application of Mr. Pierce uh, to the attention of one Debbie Dean. Uh, Mr. Conley says that he didn't know who Debbie Dean was at the time. I think he subsequently learned. And that, um, uh, that ordinarily he wouldn't do that. Now, all of this put together, doesn't that indicate that at least Mr. Conley and Mr. Ziegler had a pretty good indication that, that those discretionary funds were earmarked for Seabrook? It seems to indicate that, Congressman, that Mr. Conley and Mr. Ziegler felt that way. And would, did they get that from your conversations with them? I don't know whether they got that from my conversations or not. And my, my question is, where else would they have gotten that? Well, both Mr. Conley and Mr. Ziegler uh, were housing officials in the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. I think in this previous testimony, they indicated that they had experiences with other developers. I don't know where they got that impression, Congressman, quite frankly. Okay. But it's your testimony that you did not uh, tell them at any time uh, in that meeting that, the, uh, that, there were, that there were definitely discretionary funds for the Seabrook project already approved. At no time during that meeting did I tell them that there were definitely funds available for the Seabrook project. Okay. At any time before that meeting, did you or to your knowledge, did anyone communicate that to them? I'm not aware of anything that happened before. So then this thing just sort of developed in their minds. Why did Mr. Stevens then ask them to, to go, th if, if we, well first let me, uh, did the, did the uh, at that meeting uh, with Mr. Ziegler and Mr. Conley, is that where Mr. Stevens apparently, according to this testimony, uh, tell them to send a copy to uh, uh, Secretary Pierce, attention, Debbie Dean? I don't recollect that happening at, a, at that meeting, Congressman. Okay, you did not hear that take no. place. Were you present uh, during the entire time that Mr. Stevens was meeting with Mr. Conley and Mr. Ziegler? I was in a meeting with, I didn't meet with Mr. Conley. I, I was, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Conley was not at the meeting, you're correct, right. with Mr. Ziegler. When I met with Mr. Ziegler, Mr. Stevens was there, we had the meeting, and we left. You came in together, Mr. Stevens no, and you? No, no, we do not. We, Mr. Stevens was there before I got there. And, and, but did you leave together? We took Mr. Stevens to the uh, train station and dropped him off, either the train station or the, or the Capitol. I, I'm not certain which one. Uh, my recollection is fuzzy, Congressman, on that. Okay. When but you say I, we, I'm sorry, who is we? Uh, me and Mr. Fox. Mr. Fox okay. was also president then. But meeting. Mr. Ziegler is now gone. He's not with you anymore. Right. Okay. Um, we, I'd like to go, Mr. Gay. Um, you were t having a conversation with Mr. Weiss, uh, Congressman Weiss, on players. Uh, who, who were the folks? Um, you, you met with Ms. Dean. That's correct. Um, and you said that you didn't know at that time whether or not she was the key person making these decisions or not. That's correct. Were you aware of any sort of a committee within the uh, 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 within HUD in Washington 
that made decisions about Section 8 mod rehab housing applications? I don't remember, Congressman, at that time if I was aware of a committee. If I was, I did not know the, all the participants. Um, were you subsequently told that there was such a committee? S subsequently, some, time, some months later, I learned that there was a committee or a panel. I don't remember. And whom were you told comprised that committee? Uh, at that time, Mr. Demery, the Federal Housing Commissioner, Ms. Dean, and I believe a, a gentleman, I believe Mr. Dorsey. Okay. In your, did you have any opinions? Did you form any opinions as to um, uh, how, whether that committee actually met as a committee or whether they were, uh, or how effectively they operated as a committee? No, I would, I had no, I wouldn't have no idea what, how they would have met or. Now, I ask you that question because Secretary Pierce testified in May that there was such a committee, but then he also testified that they didn't meet very often and that uh, uh, it seemed that Ms. Dean exercised most of the, the authority of that. Uh, do you have any observations on that? Not at the time, I, I did not. I mean, I've obviously listened to some of the testimony, but at the time, 1986, 87, I didn't know uh, Ms. Dean's, uh, to the extent her role played Mr. on Manaf the panel. Oh, excuse me. You, Mr. Manafort, you were involved with HUD, uh, knew Ms. Dean, uh, set up some meetings, obviously with Mr. Cruz and whatnot. Did you know of this committee? Uh, I don't believe I did, Congressman. Okay. So when you needed to make a call or set up a meeting, whatever, you went, did you go directly to Ms. Dean then? Uh, I rarely, I can only recall calling Ms. Dean about a meeting in the one instance that I've talked about here today. Okay. And I, one loose end I wanted to tie up earlier this morning, and I wasn't able to because I had to leave for another meeting, and I apologize. And just remember that uh, it's been a long day, I know. Do you remember the two memos that were put in early on, uh, Ms. Dean? Um, the Bridgeport uh, Project. The yes, Bridgeport. That, that was it. Um, the couple of the loose ends. Mr. Cruz, you remember you call those memos? And one was actually your memo. Yes. Your proposal, and then there was a response. That's okay. correct. Um, did you get get that response? Was that mailed to you? I don't recollect whether that was mailed to me, but I, I know that I saw that response. This is not the first time I saw that, Congressman. Okay. And Mr. Manafort, I think you testified that you do not recall getting it. You might have, but you don't recall. That's correct, sir. Okay. Um, the second question I have, Congressman, if I may. Yes, sure. At the meeting that I had with. Uh, uh, Jim Ball. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Gelichich was at that meeting. He was present at that meeting amongst other HUD professionals. And one other point, if I may, uh, Congressman, you know, one of the pro on page 206 of Mr. Conley's testimony, line 4977. Mm -hmm. In October of 1987, we indicated to CFM, CDC, the developers of the project, the two corporations that make up Seabrook Associates, that if they did not pick up the pace, we would re-advertise the project and seek to find other developers who wanted to use the, re the units. You may recall that we received the award at that point about six months prior, and we were not at all satisfied with the pace at which they were progressing, and we let them know it. <laughs> I feel, Congressman, that I am not here, and I, I'm certain that Mr. Manafort is not here, trying to indicate that there was so much substantial risk that we did not want to go forward with this project. We did indeed want to go forward with the project. We wanted to go forward in the worst way with the project. But even the characterization of this public housing official indicates in the record, in the testimony, that there were some risk. Now, the degree to which you did ascribe to the risk, I understand the points that you're making. But from a, a person who is trying to put a project together in dealing with the town who had now decided that they were going to become actively involved in reviewing the plans and specs and the new building code ordinances, plus the pressures that the Department of Community Affairs was putting on us, I felt real risk. Yes, yeah, so you felt risk, but in the November meeting, uh I mean, the impression I come away from that transcript of Mr. Conley and Mr. Ziegler is that they might be down the road, they might be having problems with you, but they didn't feel they had much of a choice. That uh, uh, they, they indicate they felt 
not putting words in your mouth, I'm putting, quoting what they're saying in their testimony, they felt that this project was um, in effect approved, that the funds were coming. Uh, they're being told to send a blind copy to the Secretary of Housing uh, himself, uh, attention Debbie Dean, and so that I, I, I suspect that in their situation they would be questioning, well, we can raise some uh, objections, but somebody high up wants this project. So, I mean, that's a difference of interpretation, obviously, but it, I think you can see a reading of this transcript, uh, how you could come to that impression. So, um, anyway, Mr. Manafort, back to, um, uh, did you, do you, pers did you personally know at the time of the memo that we were discussing, the two memos we were discussing, did you personally know John Mooring? No, sir. Did you personally know James Ball? No, sir. The question I have is then, it seems that your name was well known uh, throughout the HUD, uh, the HUD office, at least in Washington, and that Ms. I can understand um, in the first memo, Mr. Mooring is apparently responding to Ms. Dean, and Ms. Dean had written and uh, instructed him to send you a copy. In the second memo, in the second memo from Mr. Ball, he seemingly spontaneously says, I suggest you send a copy to Paul Manafort. Now, why would that be? Congressman, I have no idea. Is it possible that, um, uh, or were you aware of any, uh, the, the only thing I can, yeah. I can speculate, and it's pure speculation, is that it came down from Ms. Dean that I had introduced Mr. Cruz into the system, and so that the name stuck with the proposal all the way through, I guess, but that's speculation on my part. And, and I, hopefully this will be my final question. Um, you testified that you were not aware of having received copies of that correspondence that, that, um, uh, and those two memos. Were you receiving other correspondence from HUD? Copy, um, not, well, let me clarify that. Were you receiving uh, uh, copies of memos or other correspondence uh, being sent to your attention? I have no record of it. I did very little work at HUD, Congressman. I mean, I'm here speaking for the firm. Uh, but my activity at HUD, if you separate out Seabrook, is very minimal. Yes, sir, but as I say, three levels down in the hierarchy, somebody knows enough to kick back up to Deborah Dean, you, bet you ought to send a copy to Paul Manafort. I understand that. But, but what I'm just, uh, trying to explain is I did very little work at HUD. I don't recall what, visiting HUD at, you know, very often. And so why it would be down at the third level, I can only speculate. Well, well, but in answer to my question, though, did you receive other... Uh, copies of documents. Were you on a, uh, somebody's mailing list? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not that I'm aware of, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the earlier round of questioning, uh, when I asked about the, the setting of the rents at uh, the Seabrook project, um, Mr. Manafort suggested that uh, Mr. Gay was the person who knew about that. So I'd like to first direct some questions um, to you, Mr. Gay, if I might. Um, first of all, can you tell, tell me what your involvement was with the, um, with the rent setting process? <clears throat> I remember in 1987, in the spring of 1987, and I think it was in May 1987, uh, a survey that had been conducted in the area of Seabrook uh, for the purpose of looking at the uh, fair market rents was conducted and it showed that fair market rents were in excess of the published, current published fair market rents and that uh, that might justify an exception rent. And they would have had to have been at least 10 percent above the current fair market, uh, fair market rent, and they were, according to that survey. And I forwarded this information on to a number of people. Uh, uh, Walter Johnson, the area manager for the HUD office in Newark, Deborah Dean, Tom Demery, and Tom Demery's deputy, I believe, Jim Schoenberger. Uh, from that point on, or shortly thereafter, within a number of days or a couple of weeks, the best of my recollection, I talked to Deborah Dean. I did not talk to Mr. Demery, but I did talk to Mr. Schoenberger. And they informed me that those decisions would have to be made uh, in the area HUD office. 
once uh, an application for exception rents where it was uh, applied for by the New Jersey Bureau of Housing Services. And at that point, at some point thereafter, I understand that the New Jersey Bureau of Housing Services uh, applied to the area HUD office, to Mr. Johnson's office, for an exception rent. And that uh, at some period, a, uh, sur another survey was conducted. I believe this survey was conducted by the area HUD office or in conjunction with the area HUD office, regional economist and the Bureau of Housing Services. And at some time in July, the uh, regional economist had uh, uh, certified, uh, actually he uh, indicated to Mr. Johnson that he would uh, uh, recommend to Mr. Johnson an exception rent in that, that, that there was information in the survey that justified exception rents. I don't remember what the amount or the percent percentage of exception rents that that economist was. Um, Okay, that's your understanding of what happened? That's, that's my understanding of my involvement. Your involvement. So you were aware of each of those steps. The, the first study that you were referring to, um, you say that was when was that conducted? I believe it was sometime in, uh, in April. And that was conducted by whom? I'm, I'm, I really don't know who conducted the survey. I do remember a survey that I had forwarded to the people that I had mentioned. Well, I mean, you, this was done privately, this survey, by... I, I really don't... Or this was a HUD document? No, no, th this would be a, a CD, this would have been a joint venture document, or, but I have no idea uh, who conducted the survey. And the purpose of this, su sur of this survey was to seek exception rents, is that correct? I you wouldn't have to do that to get the standard 120% of fair market rent, right? I really don't know the purpose of the survey. I can only speak to the information on the survey. Well, who, who did you get? Somebody brought it to you. Why, why were you involved at all? What, why did it come to you? Now, I was a lead associate on this account, and at some point in time, someone uh, had, had conducted a survey. I assume, can only assume it would be the uh, joint venture, and I forwarded uh, that survey on to the people I just uh, mentioned. Yeah, now just review that again. You forwarded that study on to? Um, Ms. Dean, the area manager of the Newark Hart office, Walter Johnson, Mr. Demery, and, I, and his deputy at the time, Mr. Schoenberger. Now this was before you had any commitment, correct? There was no, they had this project, this hadn't even been advertised yet. Uh, this as I said, was sometime in, in, in May, so I believe, well, I, I, yes, I believe it was after the advertisement. But you didn't get a commitment, you've been saying, until October. To this on, on, June, on June 1st, there was a conditional um, award made, I believe. Yeah, all right, so this was before June 1st. That's correct. And these rents, were my, my conversations were before June yeah. 1st. The, the actual date, and I have it here, of the letter that I sent to Ms. Dean was on uh, June 9th. So you sent a letter to Ms. Dean about these rents. Do, you, um, do we have a copy? Will you have that letter? Yet. If not, we'd like to get it. You have a, we'd like a copy sure. of that letter. I don't have it with me, but I'd be happy to furnish it. And why did you write to Ms. Dean? I had been in contact with Ms. Dean since November 14th, and I sent her, um, sent her a copy of the survey. I believe it was a copy of the survey. I don't have all the attachments. Uh, and to Mr. Johnson, to Mr. Demery, and to Mr. Schoenberger. Isn't this a, a purely technical judgment about it, what the rents ought to be? That, that's correct. And at the time, uh, a technical judgment was made, we believe, that was technically incorrect. And I was pointing that out to Ms. Dean. So you, this was an objection that you sent to Ms. Dean. You were objecting to a judgment that had been made by the area office. Is that right? Actually, I don't recall whether it was the area office. I don't it was made by an economist. I'm not sure if it was a HUD central economist or an area office Well, economist. does it refresh your recollection if I said the name John Kemp, not to be confused with Jack Kemp? Uh, I remember the name of John Kemp, but I'm not sure that's who m made the, um, uh, the, the opinion that I'm speaking of. Okay. But there was a HUD judgment to, to give a, it was a judgment to, to give an exception rent of 3% above. I, I don't have any idea what you the You don't remember what it was. I, I would have no idea what the percentages were. Okay. And you were, um, 
But, but in any case, you thought it was wrong. Uh, no. Uh, there was an opinion that we were made aware of that we believe to be technically incorrect. I forwarded that information to the people I've just mentioned, and they told me that this is something that would have to be taken up in the area HUD office, and I've stated that that is what happened, and then there was a survey, and that a regional uh, uh, HUD economist conducted uh, or certified a survey, and that ultimately the HUD area office under Mr. Johnson, uh, at the request of uh, an application by the New Jersey Bureau of Housing Services, allowed an exception rent. I don't know uh, the amount, or the percentage, but it was sometime in July. Well, now, this, this judgment about what the rent ought to be had nothing to do with your project. Isn't that right? I believe that had to do with the fair market rent within that area. In other words, the exception rent had, was based on market conditions, supposed to be based on market conditions, not on your particular project, on correct? Fair, on fair market rents, that's correct. And this was actually the responsibility of the Public Housing Authority, in this case the Department of Community Affairs, to, um, to set this rent, wasn't it, in, subject to the approval of HUD? Isn't that right? I'm not aware of that. I mean, I don't know. That, I know that it was uh, up to the Bureau of Housing Services to apply to the area HUD office for an the exception. The Bureau of Housing Services is a bureau I'm sorry, of the, uh, the, the of New Jersey of Bureau of Housing Services right. is the public housing authority with jurisdiction over Seabrook. That's correct. Right, and that's part that of, is the part of, of the community affairs. That's right. correct. So where, what were you guys doing? I mean, what, why were you writing appeals to Deborah Dean in this process? I mean, where, where did you get in here at all? You didn't even have a commitment at this point. Well, this area that these fair market rents survey has, was conducting was in our area where our project was, was going to be, and it affected our project. And we believed at the time that an opinion was being made that was technically incorrect, and ultimately the area office uh, said that uh, we were justified in, or, or that the BHS was justified in applying and asking for exception rents. I was simply pointing out to, to the, the, the four people that I had talked with or, or corresponded with at HUD that an opinion was made that we believe was technically incorrect, and I can speak to that technicality if you like. Yep, please do. Uh, that at the time, uh, the opinion was made that the numbers off of the survey had to justify an increase on the fair market rent, a 10 percent increase of the fair market rent above the mod rehab uh, subsidy, which as you know is 120 percent. And according to the HUD regulations at the time, that is incorrect. A 10 percent subsidy above the fair market rent of 100 percent is all that was needed to be justified, not a 10 percent increase over the 120 percent mod rehab subsidy. That was the opinion that was given. We then uh, went to HUD, and even after that, Ms. Dean and uh, Mr. Schoenberg said this is something that might be true, but would have to be taken up in the area HUD office. And that's ultimately where it was resolved. And my understanding was that sometime in July, an exception rent of some percentage was granted. Okay. Now, you keep saying an opinion was, that was given. What do you mean? Opinion was given by whom? As I mentioned earlier, it was an economist. It was a HUD yeah. economist. Uh, it could have been a HUD central economist, or it could have been someone else. I do not believe it was Mr. Kemp. And who was it that told you this was wrong? I mean, was this your technical expertise that you applied to this, or did someone else make no, this judgment? I, someone else made this judgment. Who was it, somebody else? It was an, an economist. I'll have to try to get you to mean that. A, not the HUD economist? Yes, sir, a HUD economist. I'm, I'm getting confused. You have a survey and a methodology which makes some judgment about exception rent, and that comes from somebody in the area office in Trenton, right? That was, that's the, the, mo the, the document that's going forward here that's raising the issue. Am I right about that? I believe that's correct. There was a document which was a survey. Okay. Now, you thought somehow you came to believe that that document was wrong. No, sir. That document was correct as ultimately proven by the area HUD office. No, no. The, the, the document I'm referring to is a survey. That original survey showed justification for an exception rent. It showed rents in excess of 10 percent of the fair market rent at the time. And what, it, was, what was the decision from which you were appealing? The decision from which I was appealing was that the regulations called for a 10 percent increase 
in the fair market rent before an exception rent could be whose, granted. Whose decision were you appealing? The area HUD economist incorrectly stated that a, and HUD economist, I'm not sure that it was the area economist, it might have been a HUD central economist, in our opinion incorrectly stated that a increase of 10 percent above the mod rehab, mod rehab rent, which is 120 percent subsidy, had to occur before an exception rent could be granted. So it's, it's arithmetic, sir. It's a difference of 20 percent. I understand the, uh, and, what you're saying. And ultimately, uh, that was borne out by the uh, area HUD office and his economist. Now, is there, is, are, do you have these documents that, uh, that underlie this? You said you I believe I have the technically incorrect uh, the memo that I'm referring to. Well, I'd like, like you to PHA produce. would have that, right, yeah. Well, I mean, we can obviously to go to the PHA, but we would like whatever documents you have that relate to this rent-setting process, the letters you sent to whomever, to Deborah Dean, to anyone else on this, plus the underlying documents uh, which you were sure, objecting. I will, go, I will uh, go back in my records to look for those. Now, did you ever speak to Hunter Cushing about this matter? I don't believe personally that I did. Well, does that mean that you think that Hunter Cushing was brought into this by someone? I think that perhaps Ms. Dean or maybe even Mr. Demery, both of whom I copied with the information we've just been talking about, probably would have talked to Mr. Cushing about this. I personally did not. I have no recollection of talking to Mr. Cushing about this. Well, the, the area economist who was, who was assigned this task and who, who told the subcommittee staff that he had approved a 3 percent exception rent um, said that he, he was called several times by Hunter Cushing. Uh, who wanted to know why a higher percentage rent couldn't be approved. And um, I just wonder uh, why it is that Hunter Cushing was involved in this kind of a technical determination that ought not to have been a matter of political influence. No, I, I don't know, sir. I have no answer for that. But you never spoke to Hunter Cushing? I, to the best of my recollection, I never spoke to Hunter Cushing about exception rents. That's correct. Did either Ms. Dean or Mr. Demery speak to you and say they were going to sign this to Hunter Cushing? No, I have no re recollection. I, one, I did not speak to Mr. Demery. I did uh, send him the survey. I did speak to his deputy. And I did send the survey and speak to Ms. Dean, who uh, quite frankly told me that this was something that had to be dealt with in the area HUD office. And eventually, the decision was made by the regional office. Isn't that right? I don't believe that to be true. Uh, Mr. Manafort, you seem to know M something Mr. about this. No, You're I, nodding and shaking. What I, what I recall at the time was that the regional economist conducted a survey or certified numbers in place of the area economist. And as my memory serves me, it was because the area economist uh, was unable to be in that part of the state due to some personal reasons and that the regional economist, at the request of the area HUD manager, Walter Johnson, conducted that survey. Yeah. I'd just like to observe that, that uh, there's so many con coincidences about the political role and things that, that um, there's a whole lot of words placed between what happened and uh, at one end and what happened at the other, but it always does seem to come out that um, uh, this project was getting very special attention from central office at HUD uh, to get things worked out from the, the initial decision to get 326 units, which Mr. Kemp, the man who was involved here, said um, he certainly knew from the beginning it was a political job and he knew he was going to catch flack for, for his decision and he did catch flack and in the end it was transferred to, uh, to another level of, uh, of consideration at HUD. Um, it, um, the reconstruction that, that we're hearing doesn't, you know, it, it's so tortured uh, compared to what seems to have gone on. M Mr. Manafort, do you want to comment on that? The, the only other comment I'd make, Congressman, is it might be uh, helpful to know that uh, twice since we were given those exception rents on July of 1987, HUD has increased the existing FMR rental rates for Cumberland County, and in the, the latest one being October 1, 1988, a year ago. And this is a normal process. And in fact, the FMR mod rehab rates now a year ago, which means they'll be updated again soon, 
already exceed the exception rents for this project so that the, re the rental rates now, if a mod rehab project were to occur in this, this co uh, county, would be higher than the FMR for our project. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask um, um, all three people who are here from, from the um, uh, Black Manafort Stone and Kelly firm um, about their current dealings with the Secretary's office um, at HUD. Um, now, it's my understanding that, the, that uh, Secretary Kemp's assistant, Scott Reed, was heavily involved in jointly with some of you uh, in, in, in Secretary Kemp's presidential campaign. And I'm curious about the kind of contact that is currently going on or has gone on since January 20th between you and uh, Mr. Reed and others in the Secretary's office. Uh, so I'd like to start with Mr. Manafort to uh, know whether there have been contacts, what the contacts have been, whether you're representing clients with respect to the Secretary's office, uh, whether you have any kind of contacts with Mr. Reed. Uh, I, ha I have not dealt with Mr. Reed since he's been at HUD. Uh, I have not dealt with Secretary Kemp since he's been at HUD. Uh, in fact, except for Seabrook, I haven't dealt with HUD since Mr. Kemp's been at HUD. Um, do you want me to speak for the whole firm? Or well, to, to the extent that you know for the firm and then the two other gentlemen who are here should, should add anything that, uh, the, for, for the themselves only, personally. The only project that we presently have that deals with, with the Department of uh, HUD is the project I referred to much earlier today on the mortgage insurance company, uh, dealing with the legislation that relates to the, uh, uh, the limitations on the, uh, let me get the exact language for this late and I'm tired. Mortgage Insurance Company of America, uh, legislative and policy matters regarding the enactment of legislation that would raise the limitations on FHA insurance. And that is the only project that, uh, that I'm aware of that we are right now actively involved in that has a HUD component because of the HUD policy issue. Although most of the work we have done has been in the Congress recently with the legislation that Senator Nichols and Senator Dixon have uh, put forward regarding raising the FHA ceilings. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Black had made an inquiry of Secretary Kemp as to what the HUD policy was on this area, and he was told that HUD's policy was uncertain, and I believe it is still uncertain. I don't know that they have taken a position. Uh, he may have also spoken to Mr. Reed, uh, but our principal activity has been, as I say, in the legislature, dealing with the legislation. Okay, thank you. Mr. Gay, you want to? <clears throat> Well, with regard to Mr. Reedy, he is a personal friend of mine, and uh, on behalf of the client that Paul just mentioned, I did make one contact with Mr. Reed some time ago in the spring or summer uh, to ask about Secretary Kemp's schedule and the possibility of a meeting between, uh, I believe, the CEO of our uh, client and Secretary Kemp. This is your client related to the mortgage insurance? Yes, yes, sir. The only client. Uh, that, that was my, probably my last contact with HUD, quite honestly, and with Mr. Reed. He uh, got back to me and told me that uh, Mr. Kemp's schedule at the time uh, would not make a meeting available, and that was my last contact on behalf of that client. And you that have was my only contact on behalf of that and client. That's your only client with the secretary's contact with the secretary's office during his term of office as secretary. No, on behalf of that client. Okay. What other contacts have there been? Uh, prior to that, uh, I had some contact with the uh, Joe Gibbs. Um, uh, Wayward Boys uh, Center uh, here in um, Virginia, uh, and uh, it was a pro bono client uh, that we represented Mr. Gibbs on, and uh, I had some contact with Mr. Reed in the very beginning, and then we dealt with some of the technical staff. For the, the your, your contact with Mr. Reed was for what purpose? To let him know that we were working on the project. There was a lot of uh, these hearings were ongoing, and I wanted him to know that we would be working on this project, and it was a pro bono project, and. What kind of a project is it? It's a center for wayward boys. Uh, it was basically fell under the category of the Transitional Housing Homeless Program. And it's a center that uh, Mr. Coach Gibbs is um, 
uh, chairman of, I believe, and involved with very heavily out in uh, near Manassas. And they, we came to us and uh, we volunteered to um, help them with the technical parts of the application. Are there any other contacts? None other than social. Is there, uh, let me, Ms. Davis, you want to? Congressman, if I might just complete yes. my answer. I have told you, to the best of my knowledge, that those are the, the complete contacts. I don't want it to be categorical because I don't know beyond that any other contacts that have happened with the Secretary's office. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, the ones I've related to, I would not have known, for example, about uh, the one he just mentioned. I forgot about uh, Mr. Gibbs. Uh, so to the best of my knowledge, We've got one contact client right now, Ed Hood, and I, ref I related to you what we did, and that's all I know at this well, stage. Would, well, would you, yes. whatever you need to do yes. to, let's, so I, we I, try I, to I, avoid three letters down the road to yes, get sir. to the, fi the bottom line. Um, I think it's important. Um, I'm going to ask one final question, but go ahead, Ms. Davis, do you have? Uh, I haven't had any direct contact uh, with officials at HUD um, until I had to file a FOIA request for this committee. Um, I do represent uh, Puerto Rico. We had a single issue uh, since the Secretary Kemp came into uh, office, uh, and that was on the determination of a, a technical uh, issue dealing with their community development block grant down there, and that was resolved within a three-week period of time. And um, does it, is, the, um, is the manner of dealing with HUD different today from what it was while you were putting the Seabrook project together, or is it the same way in which you operate, would you be operating if a client came to you now and wanted to do a project? Um, is there any difference that you know of? It would depend on the project, Congressman. With, with the Seabrook matter, uh, you know, there, there, Ms. Dean was one of a number of people who were involved in the moderate rehab program. I'm not certain where responsibilities lie at this stage at HUD, uh, and it would depend on the issue that we were dealing with. And, uh, and, you know, what we knew about how HUD was being managed as to how we might proceed. Uh, but the, import the important thing is that uh, as far as our clients are concerned, you know, we always work very openly in, in, in the system, whatever that system is. Mr. Cruz? Yes, Congressman. Um, since the beginning of the um, Bush administration, have you had direct dealings with the Secretary's office or, or political appointee level at, at HUD? Uh, I've had no direct dealings with anyone at the secretary's level or uh, any political dealings with anyone in HUD Washington. I did make a phone call to uh, a person at the area office in Hartford about a project in Hartford, but they informed me that uh, they did not have jurisdiction over the project. No further questions, Chair. Congressman Shays. Thank you. Um, it's been long, and I, I just have, I think, one question for you, Mr. Manafort, and then I, I question uh, a few questions for you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Manafort, did, um, has Black Manafort and Stone or anyone else in your company, um, any of your subsidiaries, uh, ever had any um, transactions with uh, Battle, uh, Fowler, Jaffin, and Keel, Mr. Pierce's former law firm? To the best of your knowledge, have you ever engaged that law firm? To the best of my knowledge, no, sir. Okay. Um, Mr. Davis, I, I instructed someone to give you a copy of correspondence that you had with Deborah Gordine, and you, I'm sure had a chance to look at it because I, I think it was given to you a while ago. Um, did, uh, first off, when did you leave the White House? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I left the White House in March of 87. When in March? The end of March? The beginning of March? Um, the beginning of March. So uh, within a month of 87, in general for March, April, April 2nd, 1987, you, had, you wrote a letter to Deborah Gordine very shortly after you left. Yes, sir. Um, and I'd like to talk to you about that letter. But first, I want to just, uh, just pursue a little more in depth a, a comment you made just to make sure that I'm clear. It's on the record, but I don't want to misinterpret it. You said you never advocated projects while you were working for the White House. Is that is that correct? That's correct, Congressman. But basically, you passed on information to to HUD. Yes, sir. And you you made the point that you were involved in a lot of different agencies, domestic agencies. So HUD was one of them. But you did say that you were in contact with Deborah Gordine on a daily basis. As I was with the chiefs of staff of all those agencies. You started to say that uh, you've had contact with Black Manafort and Stone, but never advocating a particular project. But let me ask you this. 
I don't, I'm not quite sure why Black Man of Fort Stone would, would contact you, being that you're at the White House and you don't work for them. So why would they contact you? Uh, I don't know, sir. Well, did they ever contact you? In relation to that one project that I mentioned to you earlier, yes, they did. And which project is that again? Uh, Waterbury. Okay, but that's the only time that they contacted you. With with regard to HUD, that's correct. Yeah. No, no other, no other um, HUD projects did they contact you about? Yeah, that's the best that I can recall. Yeah, I as, just, as you know, I don't have access to any of my records at the White House. Well, and if there was one other project, right, but if there were a lot, yeah. then it would be hard to explain. No, sir. This letter to Deborah Gordine of April 2nd says, attached is a draft of a letter that outlines the requirements we discussed with Puerto Rico as a first step towards ACED designation. And then there's just two more paragraphs. I have reviewed the draft and feel it adequately reflects the conversation we had with you on Tuesday. Please amend this draft as you feel appropriate. I would appreciate a blind copy when you are ready to transmit the letter to the IRS. Thank you for your continued assistance. Now, I don't have a copy of the draft, but I do have a letter uh, that, that eventually was sent out by HUD. And before I do that, I want to ask you a few questions here. First off, the, um, the ACED, is that the areas of economic distress? Is Chronic that and economic distress, yes, yeah. Congressman. And then in the second paragraph, it says, conversation we had with you on Tuesday. Who is we? Um, on approximately March 24th, uh, 1987. Um, I had a meeting with Miss Dean in her office with uh, the, our, my client at the time, the head of federal affairs for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, Mr. Jorge Perez, um, a lawyer from Covington and Burling who had previously been representing Puerto Rico prior to this meeting in regards to this issue, Andy Singer. Um, and the only other individual that I recall being in that meeting um, was Mr. Du Bois Gilliam, who at the time was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy Development and Evaluation. The, um, if you had been a HUD employee, would you have been able to have a meeting with Deborah Gordine? I don't know, sir. I mean, uh, in what regard do you? Well, in, in regards to the revolving door, were you not a high enough official to have been uh, come under the revolving door legislation? That, I guess that what I'm trying to understand, and this, is the, this relates to our whole purpose for being here, is to understand who should be allowed to do business with the government after leaving it and who shouldn't. I'm struck by the fact that you clearly had you know, a close relationship with Deborah Gordine, and um, I'm asking you, if you had been a HUD employee, would you have been allowed to have worked for a year after advocating projects with HUD? Congressman, I don't want to reconstruct. I'm not an expert on Okay. the laws that govern um, That's fine. in and out. I can tell you that, that I felt comfortable doing so from leaving the White House where I had worked previously. The, um, it says here, I would appreciate a blind copy. Why a blind copy? Um, I can't recall why I would have asked for a blind copy versus a carbon copy, other than um, the fact that this draft going over the Treasury Department, I don't even know if that would have been appropriate, frankly, for them to have done. Uh, what wouldn't have been appropriate? I'm sorry. To have been carbon copying a bunch of people on, on a transmittal from HUD to the uh, Department of Treasury. Well, would it be appropriate for someone like yourself to suggest a letter that they should write under, under HUD stationery? Uh, yes, sir. I, that recommendation came out of the meeting that we had where we thoroughly discussed the issue, at which point in time Miss um, Dean and Mr. Uh, Gilliam asked Andy Singer, the attorney on the case, to draft exactly what recommendations we were hoping to have HUD agree to. Um, I believe the letter might have been modified somewhat, although not extensively, and we were responding to their request. We were happy to do so. Well, let me, let me say, uh, in all candor, I, I have had circumstances where people have come to me advocating something, and I say, give me a draft, and I consider it, and 90 percent of the time it gets changed significantly. But in this case, how do you, do you recall if it was changed at all? I, I really don't know exactly what would have been changed. I would have, I would have thought that it would have been changed somewhat. Um, Deborah Gordine writes a letter to Du Bois who, who, um, who ends up, uh, Gil, Gil, Gilliam, Du Bois Gilliam, 
Deputy Assistant Secretary for Program Policy Development Evaluation. He's the one who writes this letter. So he writes the letter. Uh, but she had, we don't have a copy of, of what We don't have a copy of, of what you gave as a draft, but she says to Boy, I'm not certain which DAS handles or, or used to handle this, but have the right one get this out right away and send me a copy to send to Mr. Uh, Davis. Um, so uh, she basically, it appears, followed pretty much what, what you had wanted, I guess. Um, who is uh, at the bottom? I call when I hear I'll call when I hear from Jay Stevens. Who's Jay Stevens? Uh, Jay Stevens at the time was uh, Deputy General Counsel at the, uh, at the White House, who was just moving over to become the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia. Now, why would he, why would he, is this another project or is this something else? No, I, I really frankly don't recall what that was all about. <laughs> um, I have to tell you, I just, you know, and this is something I'll have to wrestle with, but it strikes me that you basically had not been out of HUD, excuse me, out of the White House for less than a month, and you're already meeting with Deborah Gordeen, who you've met with on a daily, not met with, spoken with on a daily basis. And you're, all, and you're working for a client in which obviously Deborah Gordeen was very important because she's able to, in, to make sure that uh, a deputy assistant secretary gets a letter out on your client's behalf. Uh, do you think that there's anything, I mean, should, is it, should this be something I should be concerned with or not? Congressman, I think if you understand what was surrounding the activities that led up to the drafting and, and ultimately the submittal of this letter, it might rest your, your thoughts a little bit. Um, in June of 1986, um, uh, Mr. Singer's law firm had, uh, had sent some correspondence to HUD um, looking for some answers on this topic. Um, and that goes back into, into the files to dig that kind of stuff up. I was not involved, obviously, at the time. Um, the two or three days after I joined the firm of Black, Manafort, and Stone in the middle of March, I left to go to Puerto Rico almost immediately um, to start having meetings with various cabinet members in Puerto Rico to discuss issues and topics that had come to light that they needed help on. Uh, Puerto Rico had been with the firm for, I believe, three years prior to that. So my immersion into the Puerto Rico issues uh, was pretty instantaneous upon joining the firm. Upon returning, this one issue um, was brought to light specifically by the head of the Federal Affairs Office in Puerto Rico, uh, Jorge Perez, who insisted that there was a deadline that had to be met on this issue, uh, the deadline being November of 88. It, that may seem like a long deadline when you're talking two years earlier, but it, it took us to October of 88 to resolve this issue, ultimately. Um, what I think that, that also deserves some, some, some uh, knowledge on this is that I, I actually was, was curious when I saw the note that you've given me uh, to Du Bois, because in my conversations with the committee council, um, I made the point that I went to Debbie Dean because I had no idea where this issue rested at HUD. Um, and I think he made the point of, of saying that he's found that as to be a surprise because of all my background having worked at HUD and, and having worked at the White House on HUD projects. Um, I thought it was interesting that, that she notes that she also didn't know where this issue rested. And so I, I was intrigued by that. But that was the reason that I immediately saw Deborah Dean upon returning from Puerto Rico as soon as I could because I knew she may know where to find uh, uh, some, I some information on this issue. But what was also interesting, though, is in the top, she writes down confidential. You know, it just, uh, you know, I just, I'm struck by the fact, that, Mr. Manafort, you, you made the point to, to, to us that, you know, you're one of many firms and why are you back? And I, I did have a conversation a long time ago with one of your partners and I said, the best way not to be back, a la what Fred Bush did, was to make sure it all comes out and so you're not invited the second time. Uh, frankly, I would have liked to have done without today. Uh, but there was so much that was left out, that's why you were invited back a second time. But having said that, generically, you know, you are probably one of the most successful firms around and you advertise that you're successful. And it strikes me that you're successful in part because of the people you hire, obviously. So, you know, you had to get to Deborah Bordine and you hire someone who, who uh, clearly had a contact with her on a daily basis. 
that's not illegal um, unless the law prevents it, and I don't think it does. But it gets to this whole ir issue of the appearance of, of favoritism and so on. Obviously, if we're going to rewrite the, the rules for you, we're going to have to rewrite it for all of Washington, um, very honestly. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody has the courage to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chief of Staff has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Manafort, keeping in mind that we're talking about scarce, hard to come by mod rehab units, and the fact that New Jersey had not received a mod rehab award since 1984, Mr. Gay has a meeting with Ms. Dean. There's no discussion about the merits. He's not even sure he mentioned Seabrook. Now, putting it in the most favorable light to your firm, and I won't use the words commitment or guarantee, but your own words, that there was a the result was a willingness to fund. Doesn't that seem strange to you when other people were even trying to get this willingness to fund? Uh, I guess the question is, was it just good lobbying by Mr. Gay? Was it the way he asked the question? Did he say please? But what would explain that? What would explain Ms. Dean willingness being- Willingness to fund. Ms. Dean's willingness. Ms. Dean's willingness to fund. Uh, you, you would have to ask Ms. Dean. Uh, We're trying. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point, I guess, that in summarizing that whole discussion that I'd like to, you know, try and have capture the record, and I know the record is confused, is what, what we were trying to say is no matter what Mr. Ziegler's impression or Mr. Connolly's impression, uh, and, and uh, even presuming that, uh, that the chairman's impression of their impressions is correct, uh, and I'm not, we did not at any time feel that we had a commitment from Ms. Dis Dean. We felt, as I said, that they would be looked on favorably, and we were pleased about that, and we proceeded on the basis of that. Uh, uh, and ultimately, the project was funded. But why would she? Why would you even come up with a willingness to fund when there's no discussion about the merits? The state has not got an award for several years. Why would there be a willingness to fund this particular project? Again, I'm not. You you would have to ask Ms. Dean that question. Certainly, we asked. You know, in this, by moving forward with the process, she understood we were seeking her support fund the program. There's no question about that. Uh, and, you know, as to what her motivations were, I really don't know. Uh, the merit worthiness issue that you raise, that was dealt with in a prima facie way by the Public Housing Authority submitting the application, uh, and, and so that had value in and of itself. Do you think it might have had to do with who was doing the asking, that it was someone from the firm of Black Manafort as opposed to, uh, you know, someone else? Because other people from the state of New Jersey, including the state housing agency, had tried to get mod rehab funds during those several years, and they had not even got a willingness to fund. Again, I can't answer t as to why she did it, uh, although we were very pleased that she did support the project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do any of you four gentlemen have anything to say before we close this hearing? No, sir. Well, I want to thank you for, for appearing. I uh, uh, think the record speaks for itself, and uh, we appreciate your cooperation. This hearing is adjourned. That concludes this hearing, focusing on alleged abuse in administering federal housing contracts. If you would like more information about the proceedings, you may write the House Government Operations Subcommittee at B349 Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Stay with us now for coverage of the 44th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Good morning from Washington. Be sure to join us here on C-SPAN 2 later for live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage.